Our sermon text this morning comes from our epistle reading from James chapter 5. We read verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So far from God's holy word. You may be seated. <coughs> Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, I think I'm pretty safe in assuming that everyone knows what to do when an emergency comes up, right? When you have need of the fire department or police, you pick up the phone and you dial 911. The operator then asks you about the nature of the emergency, where you're located, and then, that, and then begins that process of getting you the proper help. Fire trucks, rescue squad, police, whatever is needed. It's a vital service that our government provides for us that we can use in times of emergency. But you know, there are these other three <coughs> numbers, too, that we can use for assistance. There's more than just that 911. For example, if you need to find a phone number, you can dial 411. That's the number for directory assistance. Or if you're in the need of many kinds of social assistance, there's a number for that, too, 211. If you're traveling, another number that might be helpful is 511, as that can give you information on road conditions and construction alerts. For a lot of cell phone companies, 611 is a number that works. It's a number that you can dial if you want to speak to someone about your cell phone account or pay your bill, things like that. There's a number for the deaf or the hard of hearing, 711, the, the telecommunications relay system. There's even an 811. That's the digger's hotline, the number you're supposed to call before you do any digging to make sure you're not digging up any sort of buried cables. All of these numbers are special services that people use when they need some sort of assistance. They're provided for our benefit, and they're helpful when those needs arise. But you know, for, for us Christians, there's someone else who we should be contacting right away in Many of those same situations, actually all of those same situations, and many other situations. Someone who has the ability to give us the perfect solution to the problems that we face, especially when those problems are spiritual or eternal problems. It's someone who will always be there. So when we need powerful assistance, we can dial 463. <coughs> all right, so you're not actually dialing those numbers on the phone, but... If you look on your phone at, at the letters that go there, that's how you spell God. We're talking today in our service and in our sermon text in particular about our communication with God through prayer. And as we look at this text of James this morning, we see reasons why we should be calling on our wise and powerful God. First of all, we should call on Him because we all have needs. And then secondly, we should call on him because he does indeed answer prayer. In our text this morning, then, James mentions four different situations in which we should call on the Lord. Our text begins in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. These words have applied to each one of us at some time. And we're not just talking about physical suffering. We're talking about all sorts of suffering. It's a very general term here. The troubles and afflictions that come upon us in this life come to us in many and various forms. Whatever it might be, these are, these are the times when we're probably the most likely to turn to God in prayer. It's said that there are no atheists in foxholes. No matter how lax a person is in their faith otherwise, when things are going well, people tend to become a little more devoted when they're struggling. Unfortunately, 
unfortunately, all too often that faith remains only as long as the trouble lasts. Good times return, and there's that tendency for us to slack off in our communication to God. <clears throat> our God knows that this is true of us. He knows our nature, that, that we're selfish by nature, that we only want to go to Him oftentimes when we're suffering, when we have problems. And yet, even despite that, He still invites us to call upon and he still promises that he will hear. He invites us in Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Peter encourages us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, to cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Those are just a couple of the many invitations that God gives us in Scripture to dial him up in prayer. So, we should go to God in prayer, especially during those times when we struggle, those troubling times. But that's not the only time that we should call upon Him. The end of verse 13 gives us a second situation. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So if that first example here that James gives is the example of the time that we're most likely to go to God in prayer, this example is probably the time when we're least likely to go to God in prayer. Besides all the great troubles in this life that we face, God also does give us many times of blessing. There are many things in this world that God has given us to make us happy. These are reasons for us to laugh and to smile and to enjoy this life, this time of grace that the Lord has given us here. When those times come, James tells us that we should be praising our God, saying a prayer of thanks to Him. But in the good times, of course, it's easy to forget about God. Not just to pray to God, but to forget about God altogether, because, well, we think we don't need Him. But let's remember the fact that there would be no happiness, there would be no good times at all, if not for the Lord. James 1.17 tells us, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every reason for joy in this world, no matter in what form it comes, comes from the Lord. And of course, that greatest reason that we can have joy is because of that gift that He has given us by making us His children. God sent His Son to save you, to make you an heir of eternal life. That's the greatest gift that He's given you. Sending his son to pay that debt that you owe because of your sins. And now you are his dearly loved child. As we remember this, we praise God for it. And as we praise God for it, we remember to continue to rely <coughs> on him in those good times. To remember him. Because if there's anything that life has taught us, those bad times will come. That's the consequence of living in a sinful world. So as we remember God and rely on Him in those good times, we also have an easier time relying on Him in those more difficult times as well. So we ought to give praise to God. Pray to Him in the good times as well. Another time to call on God is given in our text is in time of sickness. James says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Being sick is another one of those times when we actually do think to pray to our God. And sometimes that's exactly why God sends an illness to us. So that we will turn to Him. Having nothing else that we can do, we finally do what we should have done at first. And that's turn to the Lord. Times of serious illness are, are times when we call for doctors, hospital, um, our family members. Why not also call on our God? After all, all of the sickness and disease that we face in this world is a result of sin, our sin, and the curse of sin that's in this world. Why not call on the one who has conquered all of sin by the death of the Son? As I mentioned, illness often turns our thoughts to God and our spiritual relationship with Him, especially if it's some sort of an illness that's serious, even life-threatening. So don't forget to pray. And when you're faced with those things, of course, don't forget to call me. As James directs a sick person to call on the elder, to minister to this person, that's what I'm here for. That's my job, to, 
to pray for you and with you and to bring you that word of God for comfort. That last situation then that's mentioned by James in our text is the times when we're facing temptation or dealing with sin. The end of verse 15 says, And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Oftentimes, again, when people are afflicted with sickness or trouble, they tend to think about their sins. and They tend to think about their relationship with God and wonder why God would allow some of these things to happen in our world. These are the times especially then when Satan tries his best to get us thinking that the trouble that we face is because of some specific sin that we've done. God is punishing us, and he's finally abandoned us. That's what, that's what Satan wants us to think during those times. Well, let me assure you that when we face times of struggle, that's just not true. We're not being punished for our sin. God has already punished his son. Hebrews 10, verses uh, 17 and 18 say, I will remember their sin and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So no, we're never being punished because of specific sins that we commit. Though sometimes the Lord does bring difficult situations in a, into our lives to make us think about our relationship with God, to make us think about our own sinfulness, to reflect on our sins, to confess those sins to God. He wants us to acknowledge the desperate need that we have for God in every situation in life. He wants us to recognize that we are indeed poor, miserable sinners as we confess in our worship services each week. Our whole lives are filled with sin. We fail all too often when we face temptation. Prayer of confession is one that we need to include each and every day of our lives. And it's good for us to do that. It's good for our souls. A prayer of confession helps us to realize that we need that work that Jesus has done for us, and then we're assured that Jesus has, in fact, forgiven all of those sins that we confess. What a privilege I have each week in the worship service to announce to you after the confession that your sins are are indeed forgiven. It's something that you can do privately too, confessing your sins to one another, encouraging one another with that announcement of forgiveness. It's something that you can do in private, confessing your sins to God and then reading from his word to remind yourself that all of your sins have been forgiven. It's an important part of our spiritual feeling, that forgiveness that our God has earned for us gives us another opportunity then for God to show us how much he loves us. So James lays out for us these four examples, and they cover pretty much just about everything. All of the situations that we would face in which we, will, we would want to come to the Lord in prayer. Because we have needs, don't we? We have needs because we suffer. We have needs because we're sick. We have needs because we sin. And we also have a need to pray to our God in the good times to keep us focused on the fact that those good times don't come because of us, but they come because of what God has done for us. So why don't we pray? We always have a need. Why aren't we spending significant time in prayer each day? Now, maybe some of you are, and that's great, and I would encourage you to continue doing that. But... If you're anything like me, sometimes my prayer life isn't what it ought to be. And I'm sure you've all struggled with that too. According to a 2014 Pew Research Center survey, 55% of American Christians say that they pray every day. Now, that's over half. But when you consider all of the benefits of prayer, when you consider the power of the God to whom we pray, the God who created everything that we see here, 55% seems like a very small number. In that same survey, 23% of people said that they seldom or never pray. Why is this? Scripture directs us to pray. In our Gospel reading for this morning, Jesus teaches us how to pray, giving us that model prayer in the Lord's Prayer. But so often we don't. Why is this? Is it because we forget? Is it because... 
we don't think that we really need God now and we can take care of whatever thing we're dealing with by ourselves? Is it because we don't think it really matters? Is it because we don't really believe that prayer works? I think maybe that last reason that I just mentioned is something that we all struggle with at times. Especially when we've been praying and praying for something and we don't get the answer that we want and we can't figure out why God doesn't want us to have it. You start to think, why should I bother? God doesn't listen anyway. Well, if you've ever thought that, and I know that even I have, I want to assure you today that God does indeed answer your prayers. Prayer isn't just some sort of a psychological exercise. It's real. It's meaningful. It's valuable. And God promises that he works through it. James gives us one example in our text. The last two verses talk about Elijah's prayer. First, he prayed to withhold the rain as a punishment to King Ahab and his people for their idolatry and their immorality. And then he brings the rains back as they repented through prayer. The Bible has countless examples of the times when the Lord has stepped in to answer the prayer of his people just when they needed him to. <clears throat> God does indeed respond to our prayer. So in times of illness, in times of trouble, come to God because he is that source of our greatest help. Remember, he created this world out of nothing. Talk about power. He showed how he could raise people from the dead when he was here on earth. Jesus healed also many diseases and injuries. Our God is a God of love, and he wants what's best for his children. That's why he invites us to come to us in prayer, to, to come to him in prayer, to be bold in our prayers, just like we saw from our Old Testament text with Abraham pleading over and over again with the Lord. He is our Father in Heaven, as the Lord's Prayer teaches us. If He wants, He can use miraculous means to bring answers to our prayers. In just my short time here, I've seen with some of you how God has miraculously, it seems, answered some of those prayers for you. As you've pleaded with the Lord, and He gave you what you wanted. Oftentimes, God works through natural things of this world. He works through the skills and knowledge of the people in this world, medicines, technologies, the abilities and talents that God has given to the people around us. And just because God uses those means doesn't mean that God gets any less of the credit. He's the one who makes medicines and technologies work. He's the one who gives all of that talent to people. So when you're sick, of course, you don't just lie in bed and pray to God. Yes, you should pray to God. You should do that first and during and at the end. Pray to God, yes, but of course, also go to the doctor. Seek out a medical solution. Let God work through those means that he has established to bring that, that healing and relief. And then don't forget to praise him when he's answered your prayer. But don't forget also that our all-knowing God most of all has our eternal interest at heart. There may be times where he doesn't answer our prayer the way that we want or expect. He does tell us in, in his word that he will absolutely do what is best for us. That well-known passage, Romans 8, 28, tells us that. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his prayer. But remember... What's good for us isn't always what we think is good for us. What's good for us is what's for our eternal good. Maybe it isn't in our best interest to receive the thing that we're asking for. God knows best. Sometimes God does answer our prayers. He gives us exactly what we've been asking for, and he gives it to us right away. Maybe sometimes he delays giving us. He, he gives us what we want, but it doesn't come to us right away. Maybe in those times he's giving us the opportunity to, to show our faith in him, to, to test us, to refine our faith, to teach us to persevere and not lose hope. There are times when he may give us something entirely different than what we pray for, something that's even better. Something of spiritual value, maybe, rather than material value. That's why we also pray like 
Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced betrayal, arrest, suffering, persecution. He asked the Father to take that cup of suffering away if there would be any other way that everyone could be saved. But then he added, not my will, but yours be done. A prayer of faith is a prayer that leaves the answer in God's hands, trusting that he will indeed provide what is best. So those are some of the lessons that we learn from this text as we think about prayer. It's a powerful tool that God gives us. That's why James says here in our text, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And in case you're worried that maybe God hasn't answered some of your prayers because you're not a righteous person, remember, no one is a righteous person in and of themselves. But Christ has credited you with his righteousness. He has made you righteous in God's sight. And so he gives us that privilege to be able to call on him and promise to hear us. So whether it's a quick prayer that's offered on the run or a more lengthy prayer or a serious meditation, confession, and reflection, these are all ways that we can call on God. He does hear our prayer. The phone company may have all of those three-digit numbers that we can use for assistance for our various needs, but we've got a line of assistance that's better than all of that, and we don't need to pick up a phone to dial anything. So use that hotline to heaven. Use it often. Use it boldly. Use it with faith in, in your heart in, in times of trouble and in times of joy. The Apostle Paul urges us in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing. So take advantage of God's invitation. For powerful assistance, call on him. In Jesus' name, amen.